Hello everyone and welcome to Inside Procurement, the Smart Cube's video forum examining the concepts and ideas that influence procurement and supply chain executives both today and tomorrow. We're very pleased to have as our guest today Stuart Caborn, who is the Chief Procurement Officer for Nomad Foods. Uh, Stuart is uh, I'll say one of the most progressive procurement uh, executives that we've ever come across and have had the pleasure of working with. Um, and so today's Inside Procurement episode is really focused on understanding more about Stuart, his experiences, um, his goals and strategies as he's come into Nomad Foods uh, since the beginning of this year. A very interesting time to be uh, joining an organization. Um, and then what are some of the lessons learned and what are some of the the, the, the goals or visions that he has uh, for the organization and for the procurement function in particular uh, as we go forward. So, Stuart, welcome to the, to the show. Hi, Emma. How are you? It's great to see you. Great to be here. And thank you for that very, very kind introduction. Um, give you a little background of myself. Um, so, I started my career in always really in FMCG organizations. Um, I spent a lot of time with Cork Corporation. Uh, both in the US and in Europe. I was their vice president of procurement. And then I moved to um, Findus Group actually in 2008, which was a pan-European role in the frozen food space. Um, that business ironically was sold to Nomad in 2015. So I was part of the team that actually sold Findus Group to Nomad in, at, at that time. And then I stayed with the remaining part of the business, a, a seafood business in the UK, the largest chilled and frozen seafood business in the UK uh, market until that was sold under private equity ownership last year to the 850 Food Group. And at that time, I actually got the great opportunity to join Nomad actually, um, and come back and, and uh, join what is now Europe's largest frozen food branded business. So the potted history. <laughs> and a small world where uh, you work with a related brand and, and, and you came right back to, uh, well, not just that brand, but, uh, but, but a broader stable of brands as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, what's, what's fantastic about Nomad is we have um, iconic brands in, in all of our different regions and our, our markets. We operate in 18 different uh, markets in Europe. Um, we have big power brands in, in Europe like Igloo. In the UK, we have Bird's Eye, which um, goes across fish and, and, and vegetables. Um, Aunt Bess's, which is a, a local um, heritage brand actually here in the UK, as well as Goodfellas Pizza um, and Findus, obviously, in, in big markets like Italy and France and Spain. Yeah, some pretty significant brands there. And I, I, I grew up in Hong Kong, so I grew up on, uh, on Bird's Eye and Fish Fingers. And so I know those brands very, very well. So, uh, so it's, it's great to hear. Now, you joined um, uh, Nomad in, in January of 2020 uh, of yeah. this year. So when you came in, what, what would you say attracted you to that role? And how were you thinking about procurement coming into that particular uh, role as CTO uh, at Nomad? So my original agenda when, when joining Nomad was, was, well, twofold, actually. Nomad is an incredibly progressive organization. Um, it has major brands, as we've already said, across the whole of Europe. And its intentionality uh, for growth, actually, uh, over that period of time is, 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 is really powerful and, and really strong. There's a strong backstory behind that. Um, so I was really excited to be joining a business like, uh, like this. Our vision and our values are absolutely um, at the heart of my own personal um, ethics. So we, we have a strap line of serving the world with better food but that really sort of gets into the sustainability agenda and actually turning words into action. A lot of businesses talk about visions as, as words. Nomad is, you know, with our exec leadership team, it's very strong and actually um, delivering that into action. And I, I think for me, that was my first attraction of joining Nomad. My, in terms of my agenda, my, my agenda has always been around building high energy, high-focused, award-winning procurement organizations that actually deliver true value to our consumers, as well as our internal and external stakeholders. I inherited the core of a really strong team that needed its purpose and its energy reinvigorating, and it believed in our vision and strategy of journey to future fit. 
which they've all embraced, engaged with at every level. Communication and analytical insights are the bedrock of how we enable trust and belief in our forward market predictions. That's an interesting point, Stuart. On when you talk about um, uh, infusing the team with energy and and bringing in uh, sort of a, this this sort of broader focus, you know, I'm intrigued by the vision uh, point. Maybe can you speak a little bit more about that? And, and the reason I ask is, a lot of times when we look at a lot of procurement organizations, um, and certainly newer procurement organizations, uh, ones that have just formed or that are in the process of growing. The vision piece, um, I, won't, I don't want to say it gets lost, but, but it becomes a difficult piece to manage around because there's a big focus on cost. Anytime a new procurement organization gets formed, typically the first driver is cost. But the vision piece is so important because it sets a broader set of, uh, of, of, of goals, a broader agenda. So how, how do you action that? How do you sort of think about that idea of vision uh, and, and specifically applying that at Nomad? That's a great question, Omar. And, and for me, it's about where do we want to be in the future? So the, the reason we named our strategy Journey to Future Fit is because we're not fit and ready today. So we actually wanted to look at the future three years time and actually say, where do we want to be? And then work from that point and work it back. And it's something that people can remember. And actually that drumbeat of communication becomes everyday life. It's not complicated. It's not something that people have to have written down in a handbook. It's really, really simple. And for us, it's really about that transformational change and focus on, on five key areas in our procurement vision. And um, one, we make no bones about it. In three years time, we want to be an award winning um, procurement organization with our best in class peers in the marketplace. We want that to look forward to. We want to be uh, recognized against the big businesses of, of the world, the big blue chips. And we will do it with a relentless focus around five areas. And, and that's been organizational excellence and design. We need to absolutely ensure that our organizational design is fit today for the future and aligned to our um, business objectives and direction. The second one is about people excellence. We want the best talent the best learning and development programs, and actually our people excellence program, it goes beyond Nomad representatives. It actually includes um, representatives from SmartCube, your own organization, Omar, where we collectively share the same DNA and share the same vision of where we're going. It's about supplier excellence program as well. How do we actually build supplier excellence into our future models, getting the right suppliers, the best suppliers, and ensuring that our SRM models are aligned to the future fit of again of our business. Category excellence is the other pillar. So having 20, we've, got, we've done 27 flywheels this year across our organization, just over around about a billion of cogs. And those flywheels are actually linked all the way back to the must win battles of our key uh, customers and our key sales guys around the business, fully entrenched with any market unit. And the fifth one, is around knowledge and informational excellence. So having the knowledge, having the IT platforms and having the data and the analytics to enable us to um, make our strategy fit again for the future. So enable us to predict where we're going. Very simple, very focused um, and remaining agile at all times. Yeah, and that's fantastic. You know, I'm, I have to think uh, as I sort of think through the, the, the five uh, uh, goals or strategies that you've laid out, and then when you set it up to say, you know, our goal is to be an award-winning best-in-class procurement organization, that must act as a, as a big accelerant in terms of bringing the best people into the organization. Uh, the best people want to work for progressive organizations. The best people want to work for the, the best-in-class and award-winning. Um, and, and having that emphasis on people excellence and and, and having that overarching vision, I think is, is interesting. I think, you know, we all talk about, we want the best people, but when you set a goal of being best in class and award-winning, that sets a visible bar. And, and do you find that has translated very clearly into the kind of people who are coming to you and approaching you and being part of that organi of the organization? Absolutely, Omar. We, we actually really um, focus a lot on our people and our talents. 
and really around the type of personality for the type of role that they do. In, in, group procure, in our group procurement function, we don't just employ buyers. Buyers are, are part of the, the team, but we have um, analytical um, uh, people within our team. We have agronomists in our team that are actually looking at DNA cycles of seed. Um, we're looking at full life cycle cost of, of raw materials with finance uh, business partners. And we've got HR business partners that are actually um, enabling those people to be the best they can be every single day. Our, our culture is high energy. It's high, we make no bones about it. It's high energy, high rhythm, um, and we get the job done. And that translates into the type of individual you want, whether that be, you know, you, you, get, you get buyers that are incredibly driven, that, that want to be number one. You get different buyers that are very analytically focused and, and actually look at different platforms. You get other buyers that actually, um, you know, have a, have a different mindset around uh, sustainability or ethics. Yeah. Having that blend of individuals within the team actually enables us to have the right balance, but also the right mindset uh, to move forward as, as an organization. So we're really focused on the right personalities as well as having the best in class individuals. Yeah, you know, that's really intriguing. And the, um, there, there's a couple, there's a few points to pick on there, but, 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 the, but, but a couple of them, one is having this diversity of skill sets. I think that's really critical uh, in that procurement's role is not simply to buy, but it's to deliver value. And one of the things I, I read about uh, your philosophy and about Nomad Foods um, uh, overall is your, your goal to make procurement a prime value creator within the business. Um, could you talk a little bit to that? Because I sense based on what you just said, diversity of skill sets, the goal to be progressive, the, the, the need to think big, but you define value more broadly uh, than, than the cost element. There's a wider uh, definition of how you think about value for the organization. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, within any, um, a buyer's job is, is to buy at the best possible price with the best possible payable terms that legislation will allow. Um, they're the almost givens of, a, of, of, a, of, an, of an organization. You could say that there's purchasing and there's price orientated businesses and then there's value creating organizations that's focused on procurement. Yeah. We are we're definitely on the procurement side of the model where we want to drive value all the way from the start of the supply chain or the value chain all the way through to our consumer. Um, whether that be, and actually the big pillars for us are around sustainability, they're around supplier assurance. Um, but the biggest thing I think we can do, Omar, for the future of procurement is around innovation and development, supplier enabled innovation programs, bringing the outside world inside. Um, I mean, as an example, the, the top 20 suppliers or partners to Nomad, they represent the resources of a 20 billion euro organization. They have half a million people in them and they invest a billion euros a year in CapEx and an R&D. So you need to make sure that those um, su suppliers who are gonna go and spend that money on CapEx and innovation and, and branding is actually aligned to your own personal strategy and development for the future. So when we wanna say we wanna serve the world with better food, with having better nutritionals, better sustainability models, um, and actually the best taste in products that you, you, you can get, you need to enable your suppliers who are growing the veg in the right way, who are catching seafood with the right methodology in the right way under MSC stewardship all the way through to our consumer and then delivering that message. So it's a lot more than just saying the price of X is Y. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot more than that. That's such an important point. You know, if I think back to uh, when we think about this concept of value, if I think back to when I started in strategic sourcing back in the 90s, um, there was very much an emphasis on cost uh, as being the prime component. And now that's expanded to this broader concept of value. And, and, it, and it makes so much sense because procurement, uh, as you just said, has so much influence over not just what gets bought, but how it gets used, what the implications are of all that, that is actually bought as, uh, for the purposes of the organization. And hence tapping into that supplier network, the extended ecosystem, uh, is is extremely critical. Um, 
can you speak a little bit to how you have uh, practically enabled that idea of the e extended ecosystem? In other words, that it's not simply about uh, employees of Nomad Foods themselves, but rather the partner system that we've built, the supplier ecosystem that we've built, and, and how we actually work together and embed each other in, in, in delivering to the ultimate goals that you've laid out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, what we've done, IMO, is we, we actually call it the Nomad Way. And the Nomad Way, what does that mean? It's, it's effective in, in all terms, it means it's a joint business plan between us and our major partners. And the Nomad Way will be built up of a, a sustainability pillar. So work that we will action together to drive change within our supply chains for, for the good. So for example, all of our seafood is MSC certified, but actually we're also going beyond that and working with our um, fishing uh, companies throughout the world of how do we actually future-proof the future generation um, of fish for the future. So for example, investment in new fishing fleets, um, investment in technology in nets, in gear types, um, We've recently signed up actually as a business to the, the Ghost Gear Initiative, which is about how we actually support and drive our suppliers around what we're actually, um, uh, what capex they should be spending so that, that, that Ghost Gear is a thing of the past in, 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 in our fleets. We work incredibly hard with um, our agricultural supply chains. So we actually, we've just become the first agribusiness uh, to be fully FSA gold registered. Um, so working through all the way through our cooperative of farmers, um, we don't see them as suppliers. We actually call them cooperatives because we work collectively together. Um, it's no secret, and we, we make a big market employ of it, that our frozen peas are frozen and, and, and actually harvested and frozen, manufactured and processed in 150 minutes. If they're not done in 150 minutes, they don't go in the bag. They, they're, not, they're not of bird's eye quality. So these elements of, of shared partnership and goals are all built within that Nomad Way uh, program to actually uh, drive to the consumer. Now, you know, we also talk about commercials within that too. Of course, we want the best commercials, but actually we think that if we can collectively work on programs such as innovation, then the bigger prize is not about the fact that you can probably get one cent or one dollar cheaper than the next person it's about looking at the category and saying okay fish consumption in the uk is 1.3 times a week fish consumption if you can get seafood consumption to two times a week well that's a billion euro opportunity so actually having 30 40 percent market share we'll happily take our gain share of, of growing that category and obviously private label and other manufacturers uh, will benefit from that. So everybody benefits if you grow the category. So the bigger prize is, 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 is a lot more significant than just thinking, I've got the best price. If you take, if you, I think the other thing, Omar, they're quite big on. If you leave no skin in the game for your key partners, then what are they going to invest in? How are they going to invest in technology? How are they going to invest in future R&D? How are they going to invest in sustainability um, systems? How are they going to get 100% supplier assurance right first time? It has to be a, um, a, a way of actually looking at the bigger picture of the cost that gets to the consumer rather than the cost that gets to the factory door. Anyone can buy cheap. Anyone can get a cheap price to the factory door. What's important is the value and the service that comes out the factory door to the consumer. I mean, that makes, that makes so much sense. And, you know, one of, the, one of the phrases I've heard a lot over the last six months uh, is this idea of being a customer of choice, particularly in those situations where there have been allocation issues, capacity constraints on the part of suppliers. And that's when you find out, are you a customer of choice or not? And, and I think all of what you've talked about, this long-term focus, the uh, allowing folks to have some skin in the game, to uh, be a partner, I think really drives a lot of that to ensure that you're the customer of choice. And when, when, the, when the difficult times come, which I, I do wanna to touch on when we talk about COVID uh, in just a second, but when those difficult times come, we're working, uh, we're working together to solve the problems uh, that, that we have ahead of us. Now, 
Um, one more thing I want to touch on before I talk about the, the last six months, the, specifically the, the, the pandemic experience um, uh, that, that you've navigated your way through, is one of your strategies you talked about was knowledge and information excellence. And, and as part of that, you've developed a procurement excellence team uh, within the organization. What was uh, some of the thinking and rationale and, and, and how, how have you sort of thought about developing that and embedding that in how... Uh, your team works and operates on a day-to-day -day basis? So we, we did and have got a brilliant procurement excellence team, Omar, and it's, it's focused on three key drivers. One is market research, one is um, analytics and horizon scanning, and the third is value delivery. The reason we've done that is quite simple. Anybody can buy an ingredient for today, what we are interested in is having that ingredient in five years time. Yeah. And, I, and I know that we're gonna to touch on COVID and, and, and possibly even Brexit, but it's, it's true that what's happened is that um, value chains ha around the world have changed forever during, during COVID. You, you could see when Asia started, how the, the whole value chains were starting to, to, to move and then obviously it moved into Europe and then obviously onwards to, the, to, to North America. And, you know, having analytics and foresight, when things like that happen, you can't always react immediately. But what you can do is, 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 is look ahead of the curve. So having the right market, market research, having the right analytics, and having the right value delivery, for me, that's, uh, that is an absolute source of competitive advantage because value chains will constantly evolve and having the insight and the um, the, the combination of market intelligence and market research with analytics actually gives you the combination of what you should be doing and where you should be focusing your attention for the future. Then you have value delivery that can go and execute the plan. Yeah. How, how have your category folks responded to that in terms of um, uh, not just the, I guess in terms of, of, of the kinds of intelligence and analytics that, that they've been able to receive. Uh, but then how has that you know, influenced and changed their thinking in terms of what they think the potential is, in terms of broadening the goals of the category and driving the category forward as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we operate um, with um, category flywheels. So every buyer will have their own flywheel that have the traditional um, roots of, you know, um, how to manage a, a, a category excellence model. They, they, you know, tip, nothing new, nothing um, uh, that, that's that, that most probably forward thinking procurement organizations have. The difference with having the analytics and the forward view is actually you're securing your raw material three, five, six, seven, eight, even 10 years in advance of where you need to be. If you, if you think of something like um, seafood, seafood is as sustainable as it, as it can be. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to grow significantly over the next 20, 30 years, which is why aquaculture is coming in as the, as the growth sector within, within seafood growth. So what you want to be doing is you want to be seeing where is the strong supply chains for the future? Where is the investment in, in new technology, new boats, quota? And you need to be securing yourself to those key partners now. If you, if you don't, then, you know, in five, six, ten years time, um, they'd have moved on. They'd have moved on. So having the analytics, having the market research allows us to take long term um, executable actions for, t for tomorrow. It, that, it, it, that's as simple as that. Yeah. On that note, let's let's talk a little bit about um, about COVID and the impact and in, in actions that that has um, uh, translated into for, for your team and your organization. Now, um, I'm going to try not to use words like unprecedented and new normal as we talk about COVID, because I know those have been well overused over the last six to seven months. Um, but it is such a unique event. It's, it's, one, it's one of those rare events that literally has impacted every geography, every industry uh, in different ways. Uh, some industries have been uh, uh, pretty badly impacted. Um, I think some industries, I think yours is, uh, in particular, um, has seen a surge of demand uh, that, that I don't think, you know, we, we could have foreseen otherwise. Um, it, so as you sort of think about when COVID hit, which was 
two to three months into your tenure at, at Nomad Foods, what were your first reactions as soon as you began hearing about it and as soon as you began thinking about it? And, and as you processed it, what did that mean in terms of what you needed your team to get done? Well, I think the, the first thing is, um, Omar, is that no supply chain in the world has, has not been affected by COVID. It's affected every single supply chain um, in the world, whether it be good or bad, it has affected it. And that's, um, whether it be good or bad, that's affected supply demand shifts that will still be here and beyond in 2021. Because, um, you know, as businesses are doing really, really well, that means supply demand changes positively. If they've been doing badly, then clearly, again, the supply demand factor will change um, um, in, in those two areas. We first picked this up in January when, when, um, when uh, COVID signs were, were coming out of China. And, you know, my first reaction was to evaluate those raw material flows in, in, in Asia and actually what effect that would have on our competitors as well as Nomad. Nomad are not, uh, we're not big um, buyers from, from Asia, to be quite honest with you, but some of our competitors are. And actually, um, with Chinese New Year coming up in, in March, any trade flows of a potential uh, lockdown of people not returning to the factories is going to affect trade flows. So if we're buying in Europe, well, if they can't buy in um, Asia, well, they're going to move and they're going to start buying from Europe. Um, or they're going to buy from North America, where, where it hadn't been affected yet. So those, it, it didn't matter it was in Asia in, in January. It was quite, the, the foresight for us immediately was it's going to affect these different supply chains in the future. And that's where our ProcX team really, really gave strong value and insight into what that would be and how that um, would affect some of our key markets. So we actually reacted very quickly in January to locking down our key, key raw materials and our key supply chains. Um, and to be quite honest, having that foresight, Omar, it's great saying it's sat here today in, in, in October, in January, I have no idea, and I'm sure no one in the world would have had any idea what was going to happen. But by what we did, we took a risk-adjusted view. We looked at what was happening in Asia. We knew it would have an effect on European and North American supply chains, and we, we, we secured um, our raw material for our plants. What actually then happened, if we got into uh, March and April time, was it was quite evident that the sector that we currently operate in, which is frozen food, um, the, the volume started becoming strong as people started to fill freezers and, and things like that as lockdowns started to occur. And then the food service sector, they, they had a big impact. Their, their demand was actually um, going backwards. One of the things that I'm quite proud of and what we did was um, we actually jumped in to where traditionally um, a supplier was supplying uh, heavily in food service. We actually went and supported that by saying, hey, we'll buy your chicken. It's to our specification. We'll use it and we'll supply it to the consumers that need it so desperately in, in, in our European supply chains. So we tried to access um, that raw material and try to balance um, the impact to some of our suppliers because some would have been heavily impacted based on their ratio split between food service and retail. So that's, that, was, that was the immediate impact for us, uh, Omar. And, and to be quite honest, it's, 2021 is just going to be as turbulent because uh, if you take chicken and things like that as an example, those egg sets will already start to have changed, whether it be Brazilian, European, Thai supply, those supply demand factors will be starting to be adjusted based on forward demand. So having the analytics and that market intelligence of what's going on in those different regions is already allowing us to plan for 2021 and beyond. Stuart, do you find that, um, that by taking that early start, by processing, I like the point that you made, risk adjusted decisions, right? Because nobody knows what's gonna happen you have to account for the risk and the probabilities and then decide the best path forward. Did you find, and, and maybe I'm asking an obvious question, but, but, but just to ask a question, um, did you find that by, by getting an early jump on, on these actions and decisions, how did that play out in terms of the original strategy you laid out for 2020? Did it allow you to continue doing that? Or did you say, 
we got to just stop and we got to do all these other things for now or, or did it just allow you to sort of not seamlessly but as seamlessly as possible move right through that into ensuring that your 2020 goals and targets were met i think um what what it what it proved to me omar actually was that when we spoke earlier about having a joint business plan and having a true business partnership with a with a with a supplier or a partner it, it, it proved to me that that was the right decision and that is the right action to take. Because whether there is an abundance of raw material, no one really cares. They can just get access to it and the price is cheap. When there is um, less raw material in, in the supply chain and they can supply that to many different individuals, well, do you know what? They supply it to you because you're taking the long-term view. So it proved to me, and I think it proved to Nomad, not that we needed any convincing, that actually working with our suppliers and our partners in a true um, in, a, in a true value chain approach is the right decision. It's the right decision, and and that to me was the the, the biggest element that, that that we took forward from it. Yeah. So as you approach the end of your first year at uh, at CPO at Nomad Foods, and you look back, um, I, I'd like to ask two questions. One is. What, are, what is one or two things that you're proudest of uh, in terms of what you and your team have gotten accomplished this year? That's one. And then related to that, and maybe it relates to that, maybe it could be a different point, is what advice would you give to, the, um, to other procurement professionals as they think about their own organizations and, and what they need to do going forward? So one, what are you most proud of over the last year? And secondly, what advice would you give? I think the, the, the biggest thing I'm most proud of, Omar, is my team. I think their tenacity, their culture, they, the fact that they bring it every single day is just inspiring. The fact that I speak to them through a TV screen every day rather than being in an office in London is, um, is, is incredible. And actually still feeling that energy and that belief in our vision and our goal every single day, I am super proud of them. I'm super proud of them. Um, so that I think is the most important thing. I'm really proud that they've changed the mindset of in, in Nomad 2. So they've really gone from being a procurement organization that delivers great value to a business partner that is looking at the whole supply chain for our key markets in our key countries. So whether that be giving the competitor analysis information, whether that be uh, giving horizon scanning or what's going to happen in the market, whether it be given daily COVID bulletin reports that we've, we've been doing um, about what may happen, risk adjusted uh, factors that we're going to take. We've been agile, we've been nimble. And, I, and, I, and I'm really proud that the business see group procurement as that business partner within, within Nomad now and for the future. I'm most proud of that. What I would say to any organization out there um, on what I think um, is, is good advice for the future is you may think that having the best category insight document is all you need and having a buyer's own mindset of talking to supplier is all you need. My view, it, it's not. You, you need to combine your buyer intelligence with analytical uh, data and knowledge through market research, through clear analytics of, of global value chains and supply chains and value delivery. I think they're the three things I would, I would, I would offer. Most buyers will tell you they probably do too much time on admin and, and not a great deal on strategic execution. Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you really enable your procurement excellence team to focus on value delivery, take away the project management and the burden from the, the buyer and allow them to focus on strategy direction and, and where they're taking that whole category holistically that they're there for me are the, the the big wins of um of, of procurement for the future yeah focus on the core right focus on what you really should be absolutely. doing absolutely and i think everything that you've talked about in terms of getting the best people the organizational excellence the category excellence and the flywheel knowledge uh, information insights help to fuel that so that you're spending time on the things that as a category leader you should be doing uh, which is moving the needle for the business, being a better business partner. So that's fantastic advice. It's, it, it's, and I think it resonates so strongly with how the uh, procurement, um, I'll broadly call it the, 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 the ecosystem of procurement is evolving, where, where I think we're moving towards a place where 
we need to focus more of our time on value uh, and less of our time on the admin, uh, as you said. So sure, this has been a fascinating conversation and I really appreciate you taking the time. In closing, as you look at 2021, what are you thinking? What, what do you see 2021 is holding for you and your team? Um, 2021, I, I actually, um, I'm looking forward to 2021. We've just actually um, been through a major transformational year in the backdrop of COVID and, and Brexit is, is still on the horizon for us, you know, in the future. Um, so we've prepared really strong. We've prepared well. Um, we're already um, uh, really uh, covered well in terms of 2021 and what's going to happen. And for me, it's about really tapping into now our outside in supply base and bringing it all the way into us on our, on our journey, bringing in the, um, the innovation drivers, bringing in the um, IP, even looking at building our own innovation center, Omar, so that we can actually have virtual reality tours of our global supply base, whether it be in Alaska or Brazil or Europe or the UK for, for wheat, bringing that whole world into us locally so we can then share the full value and experience of our global supply chain and partners. That's what I'm most looking forward to. That's fantastic. Well, it's exciting to hear. There's a lot of exciting ideas that are in there, very progressive ideas. And uh, we look forward to being a partner in that process uh, with yourself and with your team uh, and Nomad Foods. And, um, and excited to hear more about some of these, uh, these exciting ideas like the Innovation Center as well as we go forward. So, Stuart, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Omar, um, uh, I really, really enjoyed uh, catching up with you. And I can't wait till we, Smart Cube and uh, Nomad Procurement are um, at the end of our journey with that award-winning procurement organization together. So I'm really, really looking forward to it. Thank you, Omar. Thanks so much.